Greetings. This is Artie from Artifact Electronics. Recently I got uh, this unit. It's a Mattel and Television video game console from 1980. It's in pretty nice shape. Has the uh, two controllers with it. Has a built-in power supply, so you plug this into AC. Came off of eBay, and uh, it was sold as uh, untested but known dysfunctional. So, whatever that means, it's uh, it wasn't tested, but I guess the seller knew that whomever he got it from that it doesn't work. It was pretty reasonable. I paid like uh, 28, not like, I paid exactly $28 shipped for this. And they go in, in working condition, they usually go for about three times as much plus with additional shipping. So it was a good deal. It's in good shape. I mean, what can really go wrong, right? Well, let's find out. The main reason I wanted one of these was because uh, I didn't have one. I've actually never owned one of these. And second of all, this is one of the only classic consoles where the common games are still pretty reasonable. They're about two to four dollars in the box. I mean, that's what I got, get these for. And they have the instructions and the overlays which you need to play the game properly, and of course the cartridge. So, uh, let's put in the cartridge. And uh, they have these overlays for the controllers, which is their version of the secondary owner's manual, I guess. And so these slide in here and uh, all right I got this uh, hooked up to the antenna input on my panoramic TV and power is just a two-prong AC plug so let's get started TV's on All right then, uh, so uh, it looks like the processor is running and the video display circuitry is working and uh, and it reads cartridges and executes them. So that actually has me a bit worried because uh, if it readily powers up, what what is really wrong with this? Now let me say right, right ahead that uh, one of the biggest problems with these consoles is that the controllers start to mess up. They got this multi-layer flex circuit board thingy inside and uh, and the connection to the main console, it's, it's a, a permanent connection, but the way it connects inside is kind of hokey with little prongs touching the flex circuit and we'll have a look at all of that, but uh, Let's just say I have a pretty good idea what's going to happen now. So here you got to press on the disk to go to the main menu screen and nothing is happening. And uh, one thing, I did play around, mess around with it a little bit. And by chance I found that if you press down near where the wire connects to the controller, then uh, nothing happens. So obviously here is a defect. And the defect is that the uh, controllers, or at least this controller doesn't work. So try again. Try all the buttons. Nothing. So what that means is uh, let's first have a look at the insides of the controller itself. 
So let's peek inside. Held together by four screws. And uh, even though it doesn't show up real nice, is those screws are, all four screws are rusty. Or crusty. So let's take them out. And uh, while we're playing with this thing, let's see if we can get the screws cleaned up. The way I do that is I dunk them into acetone. Careful what container you use with acetone. There's some plastics that will eat through very quickly. So take that out of the way so I don't spill it all over my uh, work surface here. But here we go. So the top lifts off. Hmm. This was repaired. Date one thirty one one two. Repaired by M E R C, and the technician was C W. Well, I didn't do a very good job, I guess. So the directional disc lifts off. There's a spring. And uh, there's the side buttons that just slide out. They're dual function. They're not just the side buttons, but they actually hold this whole assembly in place. Here's the overlay, the button overlay, which actually performs no electrical function. And here is our sandwich, the flex circuit, membrane, contact, whatever board. And when you press a button, one of these solid pads lands on one of these uh, contact pads over here. Let me make, probably can't see that very well. There you go. So these are solid and then they land on this and make a, con uh, make a connection and then the whole thing is round routed up to here which is what connects to the console. And there's a connection. It's got these little prongs pointing up and they they connect to the board via pressure, it just overlays it. And uh, they have a piece of foam tape here. It's very thin tape, but I think the purpose of it is, is to make sure that this end, which lands on those prongs, has some pressure on it, so it makes good contact. And uh, one thing you can notice here, it actually makes contact on this part, which is fine because there's foam tape behind it, but the other contacts are made here and there's no foam tape behind it. There's nothing that presses this down when the uh, case is closed. So I think one of the problems is right, I can see is that, the, that there's no pressure on this end really making a good connection. Another thing that may have happened is that these prongs got pushed down and we're probably supposed to point up a little bit more and the obvious solution would be to bend them up but uh, they look really fragile to me and uh, if I break any of these off well then uh, pretty much then the controller is ruined so I'm not going to touch these I mean I'm probably going to clean them up but uh, where the foam tape is I'm probably going to put something else on here that covers that second uh, column of contact and see if that helps us out any. First I laid this out like this and essentially buzzed out the connections to make sure that there was continuity. There are some worrisome areas, for instance if you look at this corner over here uh, there's, there's basically a fold running ar along here and it's folded pretty sharply. So I wanted to make sure that none of these folds or anything have broken the, the continuity of these lines, that these things are actually solid, and that these things, that pretty much everything ends up connecting 
to the uh, host connector up here and I buzzed them out and at first it seemed really strange but uh, because on certain ones the buzzer didn't come on but that's because there is a, a resistance in these conductors and I guess on, on most meters uh, they will buzz if the resistance is like less than 30 ohms or so and then they won't buzz if it's more than that and on average the resistance from one end of the controller to the connector was about 35 ohms so at first it was confusing to me I thought these things were broken but then I just went by the resistance and uh, everything buzzed out everything works it's kind of a strange arrangement I mean because it's got a total of nine lines going to the main uh, to the main console but it's got more buttons than that it's got 20 it's got like 20 different contact closures on here or combos thereof so what they're doing is they're scanning the keypad and uh, so it's basically a row column thing enable enable a column read the rows and that's how you distinguish which button is actually pressed because for instance if you look at these three buttons they're actually co connected uh, they're all connected in parallel here this conductor runs along the edge and this one here but then this one injects a row or a column see these are connected vertically and these are connected horizontally and this injects a, an active signal in whatever column you want to read and then you just read the or the row and then you read the columns and uh, that's how you can uh, read uh, more switches than you have data lines going back to the main thing so I did use a uh, cotton swab or a q-tip uh, and lightly cleaned all of these contacts with alcohol isopropyl my advice to you is to try it out on a inconspicuous area such as like over here or something and make sure that the alcohol doesn't start lifting the contact material off Alcohol will lift like carbon contacts really handily, but uh, I did try it out. Nothing got lifted, nothing got cleaned up either. I mean, there was there really wasn't any dirt on here, but I did everything, and, and, and I did some connection tests. I'm not I, I'm not showing that on camera because it was really awkward to have to hold the probes in here and then fold this thing together and push a button down and see if it actually closes the contact. But it did work that all of the, the buttons, when this was folded back on top of here, when you pressed on this, it made a, a it completed the circuit, and all of these do work. So that brings us back again to this part, which connects to where did it go? Oh, here to the uh, to the main connector here. And as I said, what I'm going to try to do is basically put some thicker foam tape in here or something a little bit thicker on top of it so the uh, top of the case presses down on this a little bit more and see if that makes any sort of difference. All right, then let's uh, do a pass and see if we can get this thing back together again. Carefully, carefully. And Let's make sure that there's nothing remaining on the tape here or being pulled off by the tape. Unfortunately, it is not. So, to put it all back together again, first we fold this one back together. Oh, it's this way. And uh, got little it's got little adjustment pins here or placing pins that hold the uh, flex board or tell you where to place the flex board exactly doing this from memory there's this washer that needs to go under here and everything comes out again and misaligns itself and then we take the side buttons whose secondary function is to keep the whole thing in place. Oh, before I forget, 
we need to put the top okay so these are in place now we then slide at least attempt to slide these buttons back in the side buttons which also double as a, a fastener for that whole flex assembly and uh, and as long as you're aligned with these two pins here everything should be good All right, let me search for something to put in to reinforce this part over here so that uh, we apply a bit more pressure to those contacts. What I'm going to use is some of this uh, double-sided uh, scotch tape thing that it does have some height compared to what's in here right now. This, this thing is very thin but the, the piece of tape oh it's of course underneath the top layer of the keypad so we need to remove the top layer and uh, checking the orientation or the alignment here making sure that we're exactly overlaying contact points of where the contacts are supposed to fit in and then we're putting this back again oh it, it misaligns itself when you're folding it so Okay, feels like that's in place. Then we put the uh, the user part back, and uh, before we forget, the little washer is supposed to go between these two layers. At least that's where it was before I took it apart. We then put in the uh, side buttons again. And finally, uh, put in the spring and the disc. and then put it all back together again. That doesn't really want to close. I think uh, the foam I put in is a little bit too thick, but... Well, let, let, let's just see if any of this made a difference. Okay, the screws aren't in yet. detected the disc. Oh, and I didn't put, I put the overlay in. So it's asking me for board size and that's one of the top row buttons, one, two, or three. Let's select uh, eight by eight. Hmm, one or two player. Yeah, that's kind of misleading because uh, you would think that you're going to press one or two but it buzzes at you telling, uh, uh you have to select whether it's you versus the computer or two players. So what I'm going to select is myself against the computer and I start. 
skill level. That's the next uh, row of buttons and I'm going to go with skill. The seven button is skill one. Hmm. And it came up. That's it. So I can... My cursor is a little scraggly there, but... Well, so uh, the disk is not very accurate right now. Maybe I'll go in and give the disk contacts another clean, but... Uh, oh, those work. Enter. Clear. Enter. Well, I'm not exactly sure how to play this, but it looks like uh, putting... Like either the cleaning I gave it, even though there wasn't much of a cleaning, but I think the main thing is is that piece of foam tape I put underneath so it makes better contact is probably the main thing, it's probably the thing that, that changed things the most in here. So uh, let me actually, let, let me go in and clean up a little bit in here and then uh, put it together and put the screws back in and see if it still works. So it turns out that the uh, foam, the double-sided tape I put on was just too thick. When you put the uh, case back together, it noticeably bulged where that tape was. So what I did was I removed the foam tape. I removed most of the original foam tape, best as I could, and then put exactly three layers of electrical tape on here. It has a little bit of elasticity, not as much as the foam tape, but some elasticity. And let's see if that works. One thing to watch out for is do not make sure you don't cover this alignment hole right here, which I did on my first pass and I was wondering why I couldn't fit the uh, flex PCB back into the case. So I put it back together. This is what came off the screws, by the way. So the acetone, I mean, it still needed some rubbing, but it did a pretty good job on getting the rust off. So it still powers up, and uh, interesting, board size, number of players, skill level. Okay, now there's, there's funky, something funky going on with this disc. Up and down, well, see, up is okay. Down, it tends to move over. Right is good. And left. It. I think what we need to do here is uh, have a look. Have a look at the connections inside. Even though this is permanently connected, uh, we need to go inside anyway and check voltages and all of that. And at the same time, we can check and see what the uh, connections look like. But for the other buttons it looks like the uh, three layers of insulating tape and the light cleaning worked, but you know, until we get the stupid directional pad to work we won't know if that's a real solution. Alright then. Okay, so we remove a bunch of screws from the back and then we'll take a peek inside. Alright, the screws are out. And uh, so look at this. Uh, here's the power supply. And uh, here, and here is where the uh, controllers plug in. But they got little uh, strain relief plugs here, and here, 
so that, you know, even if you yank on them, they're not going to come out of here. They're, they're pretty securely fastened. And then we got the uh, cage with all of the uh, electronics underneath. And uh, first let's have a look at the uh, connectors coming in from the controllers. And of course here's the one that's acting up. to remove anything. I just have to be patient. Really thin wires over here. That kind of looks kind of strange and uh, you probably can't see that on the camera but yeah no way I can show that to you but uh, it looks like one of the crampon connectors is bent and a piece of metal is sticking out the back I'm sorry I can't show that to you but it's It's almost like one of these wires isn't making contact. Let me see if I can get that connector out. And we can see maybe see what's going on inside. So what I was trying to show you unsuccessfully is I pulled the pin in question out and you can see that the leaf part is missing on this. It's just like a, it's just a spade going in, and that's, it, it, it needs the little leaf part here, the folded part that connects to the opposing connector. And when I pull this thing out, this is, this piece fell out, which is the missing piece. So this was broken off actually. It was just laying in the shell. It was kind of shoved back on top of the wire itself. So we have one wire coming from the controller that was not making a connection. So uh, let me figure out uh, how to replace this thing and have a good connection and then retest it again. So here you can see the uh, connector with the broken, let's call it the, 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 the spring at the end of it, the, the bend that actually connects to the pin it slides into. And here is a new crimp on unit. Now in order to fit it to this wire I'd have to cut it here and strip it and this would be the uh, shortest wire which means it would have to take the entire load of all these wires because this is going to be the shortest one and things are always going to be pulling on the shortest wire. So originally I was just going to solder a short piece of very thin wire, join it to here and then put it into this, but uh, then I figured why not just uh, crimp the remainder of this into the new connector and then slide it back in. And this won't be the shortest wire then, and uh, it's the least amount of work. But uh, let me see if by doing all of that, this the new thing will actually fit back into here, into the connector housing properly. But let me give it a try. So I cut the remainder of this connector a little short, inserted it into the uh, new one and using a proper crimping tool like this just crimp the whole thing back together and uh, it is tight enough to not even need to be soldered so let's see if this guy now fits back into the housing if we 
to put them into the wrong, to the right spot, of course, which is here. And it's fighting me. Click. It's in. And it's tight. Well, let's see if that uh, fixes our problem. Okay, we're all plugged back in. One thing I noticed, by the way, is the uh, reset switch is a bit lazy. You have to press on it quite a bit for it to work. So anyway, we're going to have to go into this cage later on. But, so let's see... Uh, Hmm, it just went to board size. It almost acted like uh, the button pressed itself. Let's see. A bit touchy, but I guess it works. So this, this, this. Okay, it didn't really detect these buttons before, so the wire I just fixed was for the side buttons. I guess these get detected as uh, directional presses. Well, it doesn't work perfectly, but I guess I should read and see how, how do you move this guy uh, to test that, but so it's like these buttons are uh, uh, are another way to move the cursor. Well, I guess I gotta look at the manual and see what it is I'm doing wrong. But let's go ahead and take it apart and uh, look at something easy as a as an interlude and uh, kind of see uh, if we can clean up the reset button. I think that's just shitty design that the buttons kind of uh, duplicate the functions of the uh, directional controller because, uh, as you can see, I actually. Okay, that's an illegal move. How do you... Oh, I know how to play. So it does work. But, uh, yeah. Let's go inside of the uh, mother cage. Turn things off. All right, what we're just going to do is remove a bunch of screws here and uh, take out the main cage. Here's the main PCB cage with the RF shield and of course it was soldered at one over here and another one over here. And desoldering a heatsink this size is usually no easy feat, so instead of destroying my regular soldering iron, I brought out the heavy gun, literally, and that made short order of desoldering these tabs. And so the whole thing just pulls apart, and here it is in all its beauty and ugliness. One of the first things to do is to 
clean the cartridge connector over here and the best way to do that is to basically uh, drench a business card uh, fold a business card in two and drench the edge in uh, isopropyl and insert it in here a couple of times and pull it out and you can see I'm I got some black marks on this so it did get some of the dirt out of there but uh, here's the motherboard in all its beauty I'm not exactly sure which is which but you can see that it's got mostly I mean the LSI's are all general instruments there's a processor I'm not sure no this is ROM this is one of the main system ROM one of these two is the processor there is uh, a second ROM in here they call one the system ROM and the other one the program ROM I don't know why what the, what that would make the cartridge but uh, here's the sound chip that also doubles as a parallel I.O. connector and uh, the uh, the controller data uh, coming from here is actually read by the uh, sound chip which is an oddity they made a 40 pin chip out of it but uh, they don't need that many chips for the sound because it basically has three channels of square wave sound so they just put two 8-bit ports on there uh, I guess uh, to, to ease uh, system integration then there's a, uh, a graphics display chip on here which is this one I think it's called the stick STIC chip there's a character ROM there's a color ROM and a bunch of nickel and dime TTL stuff over here and that's about it that's that's what this thing looks like this is the power connector coming from the power supply the RF modulator this does not have composite outputs there are mods for it but <clears throat> I don't think it generates uh, composite video as is you have to put some extra hardware on it but uh, the picture I get out of it is uh, uh, through the uh, antenna it is decent and is uh, on par with uh, the quality of games on here so I think we're good there there's the power switch and uh, the main reason why we opened this let's get off the bottom is the uh, reset switch which is over here uh -huh. factory kludge it looks like here but uh, the uh, reset switch I mean basically this is the membrane and uh, you can get that out it's just inserted into the board and held in place with pressure and what happens is when you push this thing here it just makes contact underneath so I'm trying to get it out and clean the contact underneath there you go so all the reset switch does is connects the center contact to the to the outer four corners and there's a big black dot there so let's see if we can get rid of that black dot kind of see it see when the camera starts crapping out on focus which it already has yeah kind of shows you what that looks like so and uh, I do instead of using isopropyl on things like that I, I, I use uh, acetone right away well the block the black dot is still there but got something off so hopefully uh, the reset switch will now be more responsive it looks like it's clean on the inside 
but uh, we'll find out when we put it all back together again. So all that remains is put the reset switch back in and uh, I uh, also went through and uh, refloat a few things just to be safe. This is where this is the connector for the uh, controllers over here. These got reflowed, the power supply connector over here. And uh, that's about it. That's about all the maintenance I did. If this was acting up, I'd probably go in and unseat all of the chips, clean the pins and put them back in. I can see some discoloration on the sides here sticking out. But uh, it is working electrically. It seems to be working just fine. So. I, uh, I'm not going to mess with any of that. I'm just going to put this thing back together again. And uh, after resoldering those, and uh, let's see, let's see what, uh, if, if we, we should probably pull another game, because this is probably all user error. I'm mistaking controller malfunctions for my ignorance of how the game is run. So I'll probably pull out another game that I that I can figure out how to play properly and see if if we can basically give uh, the first controller a, a good a, a good bill of health and then just apply the same procedure to the second controller. Okay, I gave controller 2, the second one, the same treatment as controller 1. And I plugged it in instead of controller 1. The only difference in here was that I added an extra layer of electrical tape for a total of four strips instead of three. And I want to see if that makes any difference. It does seem... It does seem a bit more responsive. Still has a problem with the directional pad exactly like the first one, so that that may just be the way the game is. But it looks like they can actually somewhat play a game on this now. So I think I'm going to leave this one uh, as the first position controller and make the other one the second one and uh, let's see what we need to do next. I had this thing sitting on the bench for a while, fooling around with it, playing the game. And what it did was uh, it uh, locked up on me twice. Now it didn't lock up in the normal sense where just everything froze, but it went to a white screen. I was able to reset it afterwards, but uh, it did it again. So uh, what we didn't do before, let's do now, and that is measure the uh, power supply voltages going to the logic board. And uh, so the very first pin here is supposed to be 5 volts. And that's on. The second one is supposed to be 12 volts. Third one is unregulated. Uh, unregulated, I think it's at the 16 volts. And that one's 19. Well, it's unregulated, so the next one is ground. So it's showing a bit of a ground, res bit of a ground resistance here between the uh, capacitor's negative leg where I clipped on and the ground going to the main board. But it's it's small enough that I that I will ignore that for now. And then the last time is supposed to be minus 2.1 volts. 
and it's almost 50% higher. So the last one is basically feeds a few of the GI chips with a terminal, a power terminal labeled VBB. And I did some research on that, and it's basically the base voltage, the base biasing voltage for a unit junction transistor, and that it needs that voltage, I guess, uh, to run properly. I haven't fully researched why it needs it, but it is connected to two or maybe three chips. And since it is 50% more negative than required, if it swings any lower, it would probably cause those chips not to function properly anymore. And that's why this thing not just locked up, but the screen went black, uh, blank. So uh, we need to have a look at uh, why that voltage is so far out of range. But before that, let's do a uh, AC test on the other voltages. So when we take out the power supply board uh, to see if there's any other maintenance necessary. So back to the 5 volt connector. The ripple is well within range. The 12 volt. Again, we're well. Now the next one would probably, because it's an unregulated voltage, be somewhat high. And uh, it's not tremendously high, but significantly higher than the other two, but that's to be expected. Is there any ripple on the ground line? There is, but that's fine. And what is the ripple on the defective bias line? Mm, that's probably a bit high. Well, anyway, let's uh, pull out the schematics and see what could be causing that voltage. Going back to DC. Yeah, to be 50% 50 uh, higher in magnitude than what it's supposed to be. Here's what the power supply schematic looks like, and uh, again, it's a linear supply, very straightforward. It has full wave rectifier here. It's feeding the 5 volt regulator, which probably means it has 7, 8, or 9 volts sitting on it. And on the other side, uh, the uh, minus 2.1 volts is derived from, so this is probably sitting at minus the mirror image of this negative. It's uh, filtered here, runs through this resistor, and then hits a zener, a 2.1 volt zener. So the only thing I, I would guess right off the bat is that something went bad with the zener because uh, you're putting a voltage on this, you get a resistor here, so it should the breakdown. The breakdown voltage of the zener should appear here. So either the, zener, if the breakdown voltage went up by 50% or uh, there really isn't a whole lot else that could have gone wrong here. Now I checked at the local supply store today and uh, they did not have zener. The, the lowest zener they had was 2.4. Now since this works most of the time with minus 3.3, the 2.4 would have probably fixed it, but what I found was uh, there is this helpful alternative you can take, and that is instead of using a zener, you use three regular silicone diodes in series, which each have a uh, 0.7 volt drop. So the drop across this should be exactly 2.1 volts. And uh, detail A kind of here states diodes CR10 through CR12, which of course aren't marked on here. Well, they're, they're these. There's no holes in the board for them, but uh, if you put these three connected in series and replace the zener with it, then that should give you the same effect. And uh, what they say is you're basically 
it said here, so, oh, I looked through the parts list, and those are basically uh, 1N4148s, which are just uh, signal diodes carrying very low current. So, uh, I mean, I have a bunch of those diodes. The problem is I'm going to have to figure out a way to shoehorn them into the same location that the zener is sitting at. I didn't measure the zener in circuit, and... Uh, I mean, it, it shows normal diode characteristics, but uh, obviously when applying a voltage to it, then uh, things go bad. So let me see if I can uh, figure out a way, take out power supply board, figure out a way to physically mount these three diodes instead of this one, and see if we can go back to 2.1 volts. I removed the zener from the board, and... Uh, what it tells us is the uh, forward voltage is slightly high, but the reverse voltage shows us that this zener is in fact defective because obviously this reading should be, this should show an open connection. So again, as I explained, I don't, wasn't able to get a diode. So I'm going to use a suggestion they give us in the schematic here. The zener was sitting under this heatsink over here. So what I did was uh, I took three signal diodes in series and soldered them from the 2.1, uh, minus 2.1 volt terminal to the uh, end of the resistor over here. And, uh, yeah, it's not beautiful, but it fits back in its place. There's, it's surrounded by plastic, and uh, I put some insulation under it in case this gets smashed down, but it doesn't because I've already tested it and pushed on the board and these aren't hitting the bottom. So uh, let's put the uh, let's put this thing back in and see what the voltage reading is going to be. And uh, Here's the input voltage. Here is the feed to the PCB. So now let's have a look and see Well, let's see first of all if it turns on. You can't see the monitor. I'll just turn it on. I'll be plugged in. Okay. So the board does come up. And so now measuring VBB it's minus 2.3 it's a lot closer to the uh, <clears throat> to the nominal 2.1 but uh, you know this is this is about as close as I'm going to get but non-precision silicone diodes and that's also the uh, prescribed solution to use when uh, when a 2.1 volt zener isn't available, I guess. So that seems to work now. I guess uh, I should go in and uh, start buttoning things up. Does the stupid controller still work? Yep. 
Yes, it does. All right, let's go ahead and I'm going to give it a little bit more of a cleaning and button things up. And then we can look at the final result. So I put it all back together and uh, it didn't work. And uh, I uh, did a lot of analysis on stuff and it turned out the following was the problem. So remember how I had switched these uh, two? I put the uh, orig original number two controller into slot one because it worked properly. And then I plugged in the original one into two and uh, the game just locked up. I couldn't get in there. And after a long analysis, I found that some of the contacts under the disc here were permanently closed with the case attached to it. And I guess that confused the machine because it was looking for an all clear as far as buttons were concerned. And then it just sat there. So then what I found was after taking apart the original number two, if uh, you remember uh, on the previous, uh, a uh, few scenes previously when I took this apart and uh, dealt with the contacts, there was a white mylar washer in the middle of the uh, flex layers underneath the uh, uh, this and uh, when I opened the second one I noticed that there was a second mylar washer between uh, the bottom of the uh, circuit of the flex circuit and the case and uh, that had all obviously been removed previously or forgotten to be put back and uh, I thought uh, what the hell I uh, didn't use mylar I used my uh, uh, I used another business card and cut it out and placed it underneath the flex circuit and the case. And that seemed to fix it. So uh, it looks like I have two working controllers now. And the best way to test that is to go in. Let's start with a 6x6. Six six. Let's go to two players. And the skill level actually doesn't matter when there's two people playing. But uh, we have, we were able to get into the game. So now we can move the cursor with this one. It's still a little bit touchy, but it kind of self-centers. The cursor self-centers once it's close to something. And then you press the button, and you play your game piece, and then player two comes in, and player two does the same thing. It's not going to let me put it there. So, it looks like both controllers are fixed now, and this thing is fully functional. Just to make sure that everything was in order, I used the poker and blackjack cartridge, and uh, yes, all of the buttons work now, and uh, so uh, I can play poker and blackjack now, even though I haven't found the uh, cash out slot on here yet, but I'll just have to keep looking. Uh, the buttons all work. I mean, it hasn't been an exhaustive test, but I think I've pretty much used all the buttons and all the directions, and everything seems to work. The directions are a little bit touchy, but other than that, I think this thing is fixed now. All right, I'm done with this. It, it does work. Played some backgammon too, and... Uh, Everything's buttoned up, the controllers are back in place, they fit in neatly. And so uh, the biggest problem obviously we dealt with was more of a mechanical nature as far as the uh, uh, controllers were concerned. The uh, We had the little problem with VBB, which was high, but when all was said and done, even after fixing that, I still saw the game freeze on a white screen, but that was almost like a uh, screensaver because now that the controllers are fixed, when it did that, I would just press any button 
and the game would come right back to where it had been previously. So we are we are in good shape, and now I can uh, spend hours of fun playing all of these uh, mind-boggling uh, in television games. So if you're interested in an in television, whenever people say it doesn't work, most of the time it'll be the controllers. Of course, what got me that somebody had obviously taken this controller apart and uh, had, a, had a few parts left over, or at least one part, uh, and uh, just decided not to put it in and then wondered why it didn't work. I mean, I don't know exactly what that disc did, but obviously it fixed it, gave it some distance from the bottom of the case, but uh, it's functional now. So uh, go ahead and buy in televisions now and fix them up and have fun playing the games. Again, as I said, this is one of the only classic consoles left where you can still buy a bunch of games for a reasonable price. It's not as ridiculous as some of the uh, Nintendo cartridges. Uh, but if you, if you like this, uh, uh, make sure to mash the like button and make, also make sure to subscribe. And we'll see you later.